Welcome back on the AM show. Time now for us to usher you in to the news review. We'll get into the papers and also get the thoughts of our guests. But before I announce my guests for this Tuesday morning, let me just let you know that Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic, as always, is helping us to bring you this segment. And guess what? They're offering you, if you're a man, prostate screening for free. If you're a woman, fertility screening for free. You don't want to be caught pants down, literally. So check out your prostate if you're a man. Check out your fertility status if you're a woman, just to be sure. Yeah? It's like um, a car. You want to give it maintenance, not because there may necessarily be a fault, but if there is, then you want to get ahead of the game, be one step ahead. And that's why you ought to reach out to Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic at any of their branches. Where are they in Accra? You can locate them at Spintex opposite the Shell signboard in Kumasi, Kronum Abwehia behind the Angel Educational Complex. In Takrade at Anaji Estates, then there's Temma, Community 22, Techiman Hansua, and Isiama in Zima. Their call lines remain 0244-867-068 or 0274-234-3000. End point homeopathic clinic, the end to chronic disease. We're just the start of the news review, and we're joined by finance analyst Dr. Wisdom Kofi Dogbe. He joins us uh, this morning. Good morning, Doc. Good morning, Ben. Thank you for having me again. Good to have you. Um, you've been joining us uh, from far away for a few weeks now, and we're grateful to have you join us for another Tuesday morning. As always, I'm going to give you some two minutes, thereabouts, two minutes, let's try and stick to it, for you to reflect on anything that has caught your attention, that has got you maybe thinking or scratching your head over the last week, before we get into the papers. Thank you. Ben, uh, I want to turn in on this whole thing about Dr. Baumia's uh, recent address to the nation. I have a lot of respect for Dr. Baumia as a person, though I disagree with him on uh, a few policy items. You know, um, when Dr. Baumia and His Excellency President Akufuado, when they first won the elections, some Ghanaians had high hopes for them, and they hoped that they would indeed bring uh, transformation, economic growth, and uh, shared prosperity to the nation. If you look at their profiles and what they said on the campaign trail before they assumed office, when they came, the CD dollar exchange rate, I believe, was uh, two CDs to one dollar. And I recall the president that even campaigned on that. Um, um, just, just a sec. So when in 2016, uh, Ekufuado took over, it, it was not two CDs <clears throat> to the dollar. It was around four CDs to the dollar, if I, if I recall correctly. Just, just on that, we can cross-check. Right, right. I stand to be correct, but I listened to a campaign a message from him. Uh, when he mentioned that it was a two CD to a dollar, he promised that when he, would come, when he comes to the office, it would be one dollar to one CD. And we all know the story of how the CD compares to the dollar today. You know, Dr. Baumia had also talked about uh, moving away from taxation to production which I suspect that many economists will agree that that is a better way to grow the economy. And that promise, we all know that it also did bite the dust. There were a handful of other promises made to Ghanaians, which unfortunately did not materialize. However, I do appreciate the effort that uh, the vice president had put into, you know, trying to digitize uh, the economy, right? He spoke more of uh, digitization in his address. But I don't know if that really resonated with the citizens because it doesn't seem as, you know, that is, that is the pressing need of the average Ghanaian uh, household. We have to take care of more pressing issues first, such as unemployment, education, health care. And the but, national but, but, but he explains, he explains, Dr. Dugbe, and, and my apologies, but he explains that digitization feeds into the economy. You talk about job creation and everything in between. But... If you are digitizing and digitalizing, which is monetizing digitization, then there would be, over time, the trickle-down effect. When, he, when you digitize the DVLA, when you digitize the passport office and all of that, you are taking away 
uh, money that would have ended up with Goro Boys and other, you know, unscrupulous characters and feeding it back into the system. So eventually that would create some jobs among others. Don't you see it that way? Ben, you have a point. But the problem now is that Ghanaians are not feeling that in their pocketbooks today. That is why it doesn't resonate with them. I really support it, right? We need to catch up with developed nations, but it doesn't resonate with the Ghanaian population at this time. Now, coming back to uh, Dr. Baumia's speech itself, I tend to agree that it is quite an indictment on the current administration, which is part of. And I also think it was such a missed opportunity for him. Uh, he has such a huge platform, Ben, an opportunity to connect to the average Guinean and genuinely sell his vision. And it is my opinion that he did not leverage that platform to convince many Ghanaians that he's the man for the moment. Now, here's why I think that was a missed opportunity. From what I read, he failed to take responsibility or, or accountability for the current uh, poor state of the economy, a situation that was co caused by some of the failed policies that this administration implemented. But he says he's, the, he's the mate. He's the driver's mate. He's not the driver. He's the mate, the conductor. He's not the driver. That. I'll get to that in a second. Mm -hmm. I learned that he was the chairman of the economic management team, and arguably, Ben, he had a prominent seat at the table when some of these policy decisions were being crafted and adopted. To me, his attempt to separate himself from the current administration, it can be likened to a divorce proceeding where the parties have too many entanglements that the courts will need uh, ample time to unwind each entanglement and grant that divorce. You know, it will be a divorce that will take far more than one year to dissolve, and he doesn't necessarily have that much time before the elections in December. Look, the little I know about leadership is this. When things go south, you don't blame others. You man up and own up and go to those who hired you into that position. Transparently admit that mistakes were made. Explain the impact to your employers and give them some comfort, you know, by presenting a solid plan on what you have learned in the field work and how you intend to uh, remediate the situation. In some corporate settings, man, I believe you may be fired on the spot if you, you as a leader, you go before your employers and tell them I am aware that this humongous issue has happened under my watch, but it was not my fault. Please promote me uh, from a driver's mate to the main driver and I'll fix the problem. You know, Dr. Baumia is in a poor position today to implement right now some of his vision items that he is selling to Ghanaians without having to wait to be president first. In advanced democracies, Ben, if you have fundamental differences in ideologies, as Dr. Bahumia wants Ghanaians to believe that he has with his boss, such as in the areas of transition, the right thing to do is to resign. I'll give you a typical example. United States Vice President John uh, C. Cahoon he was a vice president under uh, uh, Presidents uh, John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. He resigned from the presidency under Adams also because of Adams' high taxes and tariffs. That was an ideological difference. You know, so he did the noble thing, resigned and pitched camp with another politician. If Dr. Bohemia had resigned as a result of this supposed disagreement, with His Excellency President Akufuado and his government on taxes, for example, his current comments, I believe, would have resonated better with the citizens of Ghana. Look, right. Dr. Baumia <clears throat> is a fine statement, right? <clears throat> and I'm sure uh, that his advisors are doing a great job advising, but this is one strategy that I think they will need to recalibrate if they want to uh, make breaking the eight a reality. Dr. Kwame Nkrumah once said, those who judge us merely by the heights that we've achieved, they will do well to remember the deep places from which we started. Right. It would be a better, I think it would be a better success story, in my opinion, if Dr. Baumia takes responsibility and accountability of the failures of this current administration, which I like to liken to the deep places that Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was talking about. Okay. Interesting thoughts, interesting reflections. Of course, um, just to point out that as we know, while the 1992 Constitution has its own specifications in terms of the president or the executive and what a vice president would be expected to do, this convention of having a vice president serve as head of the economic management team or member 
of the economic management team. We've cited documents to the effect that when John Dramani Mahama was, you know, made vice president, some documentation pointing to the fact that he was encouraged. In fact, he was given um, the position of a member of the economic management team, not necessarily the head. And if you look at the constitution of the economic management team under any regime, you would have crucial players like a finance minister, like depending on who's on cabinet and what the framing uh, would be at the time, but likely a trade minister, energy minister, um, among others. So membership, what does it mean? Heading, what does it mean by convention? And um, how much can we pin him down to on that? I have said that I've been personally uh, disappointed about some of the parrying, not just by Dr. Baumia, but by other candidates as well. Oh, when I was there, this and that. Owning up to responsibility, like you said, is a mark of leadership. If you can't own up and say, yes, this happened under my watch, I was a part of it, then it's problematic. And Alan Tremantin, uh, I think on the very day that Dr. Baumia spoke, made mention of that. And he said, for him, he takes responsibility for staying with this, this administration and everything that happened in between and that the vice president should do same. But I guess these are our opinions and the verdict uh, is out there for all of us to make. But let's quickly get into the papers and then take some quick reflections. The Daily Graphic says FDA to shut down unlicensed canteens. Uh, there's also many of our country's laws outmoded. Professor Tuguba, uh, Dean of the University of Ghana Law School, says so. Tackling climate change, Ghana to receive $850 million uh, in support from Switzerland. GCB Bank appoints Daniel Asrifi as board chairman. On the back page, 259 MMDCEs inaugurated. So let's get into the details. <clears throat> now, the Food and Drugs Authority has warned that it may close canteens and food service units of public institutions if they operate without a valid food hygiene permit from the authority. It has therefore cautioned all unlicensed food service establishments that failure to acquire the food hygiene permit by February 29, 2024 would, quote, attract the requisite regulatory sanctions, which may include the closure of facilities, fines, and or criminal prosecutions. Now, it has consequently advised canteens of schools, hospitals, and all corporate institutions to ensure that their food service facilities are, quote, inspected and licensed by the FDA. It also advised them to, to only contract the services of licensed caterers for the catering of corporate meetings, lunches, and daily meals for students and patients. Um, this is something to be taken seriously because guess what? I mean, a friend was recently sharing with me how in her outfit, of course, I can't mention the name, but you have people not exactly observing hygienic uh, processes when dealing with food. For example, you can tell some of them have gone down with colds. It could be COVID. It could be anything. And they are coughing and they are serving meals and everything in between. And they are not wearing masks. So you ask yourself, I mean, what kind of systems we have. And it's good that the FDA is moving out on that. Better late than never, I say. Let me quickly go to page 13 and uh, do those two stories there, and then you can come in, uh, Doc. After that, we'll go on the international front. So Ghana is expecting to receive up to $850 million from Switzerland in direct investment, carbon revenues and fees by 2030 as part of the country's efforts to fight climate change. Now, the amount is due from eight out of 12 projects being developed under an agreement with Switzerland, which have reached investment decision points. The Minister of Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation, Dr. Kwekwe Frie, who disclosed this at the launch of the 2023 annual report on the implementation of Article 6.2 of the Paris Agreement in Accra last Friday, stressed that Ghana was currently at the forefront of the fight against the impact of global warming and its attendant climate change issues. I know you're also passionate about climate change, and especially as it affects Africa, probably more than any other uh, continent. And finally, I'm just putting all of these together. So there's the shutting down of unlicensed canteens, the FDA's move. 
There is the receipt, planned receipt of $850 million in support from Switzerland by 2030 to fight climate change. And finally, many of our country's laws outmoded. That's according to Professor Atuguba. Now, the dean of the University of Ghana School of Law, Professor Raymond Akonburo Atuguba, has said many of the country's laws are outmoded, making it difficult for people to adhere to ethical principles in the corporate world, particularly the banking sector. Quoting him, he says... Our laws are not in tune with the times. How do you determine ethics with such a legal framework, he questioned. And I found it interesting because recently the Chief Justice was talking about uh, adding a dress code to the legal ethics uh, system or its, its teaching. Now, speaking at the GCB Platinum Thought Leadership Conference in Accra last Friday, Professor Tugubu said uh, the country still had about 10 English laws in its statutes passed between 1539 and 1863. Imagine that. He said since the laws, including the Bills of Exchange Act 1961, that is Act 55, were passed years ago, there had been significant developments which required that new laws were passed to align with the current trends, but that had not been done. And, and that is what he's talking about, which also reminds me of our driving code. I think it goes back to the 1970s, I think, and since that time, We've not had any amendments uh, to them. I stand corrected um, if, if anyone has contradictory um, information. But over to you, Doc. Three issues for your dissection. What do you make of them? You know, I think Professor Tuguba is spot on on this one. Uh, Professor Tuguba is one of the smart brains in the country, and I was fortunate to have been taught by him as oh, to point I see. during my studies yeah, at the University of Ghana Legal. I see. You know, a handful of our laws were enacted many years ago, and uh, with a lot, a lot of things changing in our world today, I think it is time to review and amend some of these laws uh, that are data, just like uh, the professor was talking about. It is a critical initiative that we must undertake to ensure that the legal framework of our nation remains effective and relevant, and also aligns with the changing or evolving needs and principles of society. If you think about it, people and businesses and society as a whole, and also technology. All of these are ever evolving. And if we still continue to apply laws that have long passed, they are times of relevance, we may not effectively be able to solve uh, new challenges in the society, which can lead to miscarriage of justice. For example, if we're serious about uh, continuing to digitize the economy, we have to move away from our dated laws, right? or amend these laws to properly address emerging challenges such as uh, cyber fraud and data privacy. We have to review and amend some of these laws that were uh, enacted decades ago to ensure that their legal framework is at pace, you know, with societal and also technological changes, uh, providing that transparency and some guidance in uh, new and also complex uh, circumstances. Then also, if you think about it, Ben, the issue of backlog of cases in a judicial system. It could be that, or let me even just ask it, could it be that some of our laws are so opaque or addicted, uh, leading to longer times to uh, decipher the issues and provide a ruling? We have seen cases such as uh, uh, the one involving the late uh, Major Mahama, ACP, Agoju, and uh, many other cases, what they're taking so long to resolve, right? And uh, some of these are data laws might create uh, what I call significant inefficiencies in the legal system, causing delays, misunderstandings, and unnecessary burdens on citizens and uh, other participants in the legal proceedings. Our society is evolving in many ways. And so we need to review and amend some of these laws, uh, streamline uh, legal requirements and remove obsolete processes. That, in my opinion, is how we can and better improve as a nation from a legal point of view, uh, make the processes effective and efficient so that all citizens can have access, right, and use the laws on our books uh, fairly. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there's been significant generational shift, right, since some of these laws were not enacted. Then, since then, societal principles and values, like I said earlier, have been evolving. And so, these outdated laws may not necessarily be in sync with human rights standards and social justice. So I believe that Parliament may want to uh, review and amend these outdated laws to enable the nation to properly address inequalities, 
uh, provide inclusivity for all, regardless of social class or any other consideration, and, and basically ensure uniform protection without bias. Now, one of the key things that Ghana needs today is economic growth and innovation. I think it would be a travesty if we have any outdated laws on our books that impede economic growth and innovation by creating unnecessary barriers, impeding entrepreneurship, and uh, stifling business activities. I don't know of any, but I hope that we would have laws that provide more favorable uh, regulatory framework, supports innovation, promotes investment in businesses. That is one way we can position the nation you know, to attract both domestic and foreign investment, stimulate the economy, and that will lead to overall economic prosperity for all. I also need, I think that we need to review and amend some of these outdated laws to provide clarity then and certainty and build that public trust in the legal system. When laws are not very clear, when they are ambiguous or no longer relevant, it really undermines the rule of law and the confidence that citizens have in, uh, with regards to the legal rights and uh, their protection. So I think that someone needs to listen to uh, Professor Tuguba and lead the way through a uh, comprehensive consultation uh, involving more legal experts, uh, the society as a whole, and also policymakers to review and possibly amend our outdated laws. All right. Well, let's get into some other stories then. Uh, on page five, ECOWAS chair in Senegal to meet Sal over uh, postponed elections. That's Maki Sal. And uh, yes, now we keep talking and uh, ECOWAS has been forced to do something. The leadership of ECOWAS, uh, if you keep sitting down, it's like Henry Ford said, if you keep doing things the same way, you keep getting the same results, right? Nothing will change unless, of course, something else, some other factor has changed that will make your actions uh, yield different results. So that's interesting to see. Nigerian President Bola Tinubu <clears throat> is meeting his Senegalese counterpart, Macky Sall, in the capital, Dakar, as a constitutional crisis continues there over the postponement of elections initially scheduled for this month. Tinubu, who is also chair of the Economic Community of West African States, is in Dakar for a one-day trip uh, after the days after the bloc's region. Uh, foreign ministers held emergency talks in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. Sal's decision to push back the February 25 presidential vote has plunged Senegal into one of its worst crises since independence from France in 1960. Then, Nigeria mourns Access Bank CEO as authorities investigate crash. I'm sure since you are in the, finance, uh, the financial sector, I'm sure you followed this story about the CEO of one of the country's largest banks after he and five others were killed last Friday in a helicopter crash in uh, Southern California's desert area. Herbert Wigwe, chief executive officer of Access Bank, and his wife and son were among the six people on board when the aircraft went down shortly after 10 p.m. near Interstate, uh, or Interstate 15. Of course, we also know that they were going to watch the Super Bowl event, I believe, between the Kansas Chiefs and uh, the other team, the Kansas Chiefs coming through. And unfortunately, this is what happened. What is interesting is that within that sa those same days, within that week, another helicopter incident involving five Marines happened dead. They, uh, you know, the, the CEO with his family dead. And then there was another incident, I think, involving two people. And people were asking what exactly was going on in, in that region. And people were also, you know, speaking to regulatory efforts and whether um, the right stipulations were being stuck to in allowing these flights uh, to take place. In other international stories, Stoltenberg criticizes Trump's NATO comments, um, saying any suggesting that Allies will not defend each other, undermines all of our security, including that of the U.S., and puts American and European soldiers at increased risk, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said in a written statement. You know, Trump had suggested that those countries that were not paying up their dues in NATO could be targeted by Russia. As for Trump, well, if the Americans opt for another dose, um, I guess that would be... Uh, the interesting thing is, it's not just them, because whom, whom, 
whoever um, gets elected as president there basically impacts, shapes global policy and even peace uh, in, to a large extent. But anyway, I don't know what your reflections are on those international stories. Maki Sal, uh, the CEO, Access Bank, may so rest in peace together with his family, and uh, NATO's Stoltenberg on Trump. Any quick thoughts? Yeah, my thoughts and prayers uh, with the family of the CEO of Access Bank. But I would like to react to uh, the Senegal story about Macky Sall. And if we have time, I would like to touch on uh, ne uh, Trump's comment on NATO as well. You know, I took some time to read a bit more about the situation in Senegal. And I must admit that Senegal or its leaders run the risk of tarnishing the image of the country as one of the most stable and enviable democracies in the sub-region. A country that hasn't experienced any of the military takeovers that West African countries have experienced. You know, President uh, Marquis Sass' antics so far, including postponing elections indefinitely, colluding with lawmakers to extend his mandate by 10 more months, all these, right, it smells of a uh, constitutional coup as the opposition leader, Khalifa Saul, rightfully is calling it. There was one fatality reported, and that could, be, uh, could have been avoided. I am tempted to ask if indeed President Mark Saul has concerns about the eligibility of the presidential candidates. Shouldn't the Electoral Commission be in a better position to handle that and disqualify any candidate who is not eligible? Or better still, isn't that what the constitutional courts are supposed to be doing and not the executive and legislative arm of government? That is the problem we have in some parts of Africa, Ben. Insatiable hunger for power that oftentimes is characterized by uh, bad leadership. We are not learning from our history as a continent. Every time our leaders have completed their attempts and refused to leave, then it created several problems, including um, uh, socioeconomic destabilization in these countries. Look at the case of Ga the Gambia, President Yaya Jame, who served this country from 94 to uh, uh, 2017. He initially considered defe uh, defeat in the 2016 presidential elections, but he reversed course and allegedly uh, uh, he said that there were electoral malpractices. So he refused to go. This created a political impasse and caused fears of violence. Of course, eventually, that enormous uh, 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 regional pressure that they mounted on, on him paid, uh, paid off. He, he was forced to leave, right? It is the same Senegal whose armies entered the Gambia to help remove Jamaica from power if he didn't concede to Adama Barrow. Then we have our, late, uh, our own late grandpa, Robert Mugabe, who rose Zimbabwe for 37 years. His refusal to step down, despite extensive protest and pressure, that led to serious uh, political and uh, economic catastrophe in the country. Well, we saw some of these worst uh, attacks of hyperinflation in the world, unemployment, and serious human rights abuses. His own party, ZANU-PF, colluded with the opposition in a, bid to imp in, a, in, a, in a bid to impeach him before he eventually resigned. Then we have Laurent Bagu, who ruled Ivory Coast for over a decade. Right. Uh, 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 today's Hello. election led to serious political, political... All of this, we should learn from this. Mm. And even right now, right, in the case of Senegal, one would expect uh, President Saul to learn from this event in the 2012 mm. election, where his own predecessor, President Abdullahi uh, uh, Wade, controversially, yeah. he tried to secure a third term in office. Exactly. The social unrest and all of that. Yeah. Say that again? No, I was saying exactly. It, it appears they, they never learn. You, you can talk about Laurent Gbagbo and his predecessor, Alassane Ouattara, who has got himself a third term, unconstitutionally, so to speak, with ECOWAS looking on, and now Macky Sall and your reference to Abdullahi Wade. So it, it appears they are no better than their predecessors. I was just corroborating what you were saying. Go exactly, and then... And this is why ECOWAS needs to step in more forcefully. I don't mean with boots on the ground, but their messaging on events in Senegal should be forceful and very clear to prove to all those that are skeptical 
of uh, the organization that it is still committed to its mandate of regional peace and integration. I believe in this mandate. And I read that, of course, uh, uh, they pleaded with Senegal's political class to urgently resolve the impasse and restore uh, the electoral calendar. I think their messaging should be strong. Uh, it's a good thing that uh, uh, the delegation from Nigeria is going over there to try and help uh, resolve the issue. But I expect Akuas to be more forceful right. and make it very, very clear the what will be the replication implications of some of these things. All right. Let's get into the, the other papers very quickly, and it's a wrap. 259 MMDA is inaugurated nationwide as assembly members take office. Uh, GCB Bank appoints new board chairman. There's also seven arrested over alleged murder of Drapa Dubai CEO. I don't know whether you've chanced on that story, but um, it, it's one that has left a very sour, if not bitter taste in the mouths of many. 143 Ghanaians voluntarily repatriated from Libya. I'll do those two stories on pages three and... Eight. So let's get there. Seven people have so far been arrested at Drapa in the Upper West region in connection with the alleged murder of the chief executive officer of the Royal Cozy Hills Hotel, Mr. Eric Johnson, at the facility on Sunday. According to a statement released by the Ghana Police Service on, on its official Twitter handle, uh, Kumbata Kweku was initially detained to assist the police with investigation after the regional crime scene management team visited the scene of the incident. Updated police statements indicated that four more suspects whose names were given as Dokuri Foster, uh, Braima Kasim, Beyua Felix and Michael Kluge, all workers at the hotel, were nabbed Sunday evening. The other two suspects who were identified as Favor, Favor Norbe and Charles Tuoze also staff of the Royal Cozy Hills Hotel, which has been nicknamed uh, Drapa Dubai, were arrested on Monday morning for investigations. I don't know whether you follow the story, but the, the facts are that, I mean, if you follow, you would realize with the killer knowing to climb a ladder, go into the exact place where he was, it's a huge place, knowing exactly where the man would be after he had finished having his bath and all of that, it just points to the fact that there must have been some inside knowledge or someone for on the inside who gave intel on this person. Another thing that beats my mind, the fact that when the, the killer was done, he went out in the man's car and our correspondent, Rafiq Salam, who knows the man very well and has been to his place a number of times, speaks of the fact that even if you were entering his um, housing unit, you wouldn't go with your car. It would be parked outside and you would enter with his car, which meant that it's, it was only his car that could go in and come out. And this person even knew that. You would also ask yourself the security personnel, and some of them have been nabbed as well, uh, allowing the person to leave. Maybe they didn't see the, the one who was driving. Maybe the assumption was that it was the boss who was in it. But uh, were there no... It's, it leaves for a lot of questioning, but um, we'll leave the police to do their work. For example, this person later abandoned the vehicle that had been used. Forensics, for example, are we going to be able to get any fingerprints or something uh, of the sort? I'll just do this, these ones in addition. Uh, 143 Ghanaians voluntarily repatriated from Libya. A total of 143 Ghanaians who traveled to Libya in pursuit, in pursuit of better opportunities were voluntarily brought back home on Thursday night via a chartered flight. Uh, this number comprised uh, 137 men, 6 women and 5 children. 21 of them had moderate medical conditions, including 2 who were wheelchair bound and 1 suffering from blindness. This brings to a total of 5,142 Ghanaians who have willingly returned since 2017 under the International Organization for Migration's Voluntary Humanitarian Return Assistance Program. I had someone reach out to me who had, uh, I had spoken to years ago, just a few months ago, reach out to me and say he was in Libya, he had been in prison at a point, he had been, there had been a militia group that had got them out and now he was with, it was a convoluted story, but when your citizens are willing to make the dangerous d journey to a place like Libya, then you know that there are problems. Quick thoughts? First, I think we need to implement policies that will make uh, being in Ghana attractive to the youth and uh, they don't feel the need to uh, go through all of that trouble just to get to greener pastures. I think it's a failure from a policy perspective. 
Now, uh, let me qu uh, quickly comment on the Jirapai issue. I think it's a saddening issue, uh, Ben. From the little I heard about him, um, he was a true visionary and a key player in the business community. So definitely his loss would bite a lot deeper. Someone who was such a, a, an accomplished and exceptional entrepreneur, uh, from what I'm hearing, a smart business leader, and I'm sure he was a mentor to many. It is a huge loss, but it, it is my hope that the business community and his family may take solace in the fact that he has uh, he had a huge impact, right, and left an indelible mark on many lives uh, and on the business community. Uh, before we got on this uh, on, the, your, on your show, I was watching your news when uh, citizens over there were giving testimony or account of how good the man was, how supportive he was in the uh, in the community. So he left an indelible mark. If you read about what he had accomplished in the business world, you will notice that he was not just a clever and a successful business person, but uh, also an inspiration for many uh, aspiring entrepreneurs and leaders in the region. So let's uh, honor his legacy as we work through uh, coming to terms with such uh, profound loss for the nation and for the business world. Uh, we have to celebrate his accomplishment and uh, also his huge influence, like I said, in the business community. Again, my thoughts and prayers are with his grieving family and friends and uh, his employees at this time. And I hope that uh, ongoing investigations can yield some closure for the family and hold accountable those responsible for this uh, barbaric act. All right. Uh, final batch of stories and we can go. Um, you may have heard of the National Media Commission's chairman, Mr. Yao Buedu Ayabwafu, himself, a former journalist himself, I believe an editor at some point. And he has said that the media blackout proposed by the GJA against some people who have violently attacked media people um, and the likes of maybe how Akum Sin have been mentioned, the likes of Farouk Aliou Muhammad, all these issues are being investigated, that the blackout or the media not deciding not to have anything to do with them is not the way to go. Uh, the GJA has rebuffed that, and I'm, I'm wondering, though, um, Mr. Ayabwafo, of course, like I said, he's from our stock. He's been here. He's done that. Uh, he was appointed by this administration on the NMC, and then the NMC members voted him as chairperson. So some have wondered whether his comments are not because this is going against government uh, and the same regime that handpicked him and put him there. Who knows? Whatever the case may be. The Daily Guide says, Baumia, the story I'll highlight, Baumia better than Mahama. That's according to uh, Kofi Bento, and he has caught quite some flack on the back of some of those justifications. I listened to Newsfile on Saturday with his justifications, and I wasn't convinced, but I don't know whether you were. And then the New Finder newspaper, uh, Veep's tax reform's good, but can't wait till 2025. Uh, Professor Lord Mensa says so. He says, the tax reforms being proposed by Dr. Baumia, they are good. But why can't he start implementing them now if he feels they can be uh, done? You have a minute on these and we can go. You can pick one or two. Yeah, I think I, I saw the news uh, regarding the NMC and also DJ, uh, DJ. And I'll tell you this. If you look around the world today, the nations that have stronger democ democracies are the nations in which the media thrives without fear or intimidation. So there is a strong correlation between the freedom of the, of the press and the growth or strengthening of a country's democracy. This is because the media plays that crucial role as a watchdog and providing the nation with information and analysis. Of course, the media and its practitioners should be uh, also held accountable and to higher standards of reporting, but they are indispensable to a nation's democracy. Not only do you guys uh, uh, inform the public, but you also promote transparency and also accountability. See how much coverage issues like the nation's debt, right? The debt crisis and all of those issues have received. Right. Ghanaians no more because the media facilitates that public debate and discussion on the issue protecting civil uh, civil liberties. Right. That said, while these attacks on the media should be condemned in uh, no uncertain terms, I think it is vital to mention that the media must also govern itself and protect its uh, uh, reportage from being biased and from uh, misinformation, as we've seen across, not in Ghana, but in uh, different parts of the world where uh, misinformation is uh, is running rampant today. So I think in governing itself, if the media sees a fit to blacklist any individual 
or entity who encourages violence against them, then I have no issues with that at all. All right. Thank you, uh, Doc, for joining us for another segment of the News Review. It's been refreshing, and we wish you the best of the day. Thank you. That is finance analyst Dr. Wisdom Kofi uh, Dugbe. He is our guest. There's more coming your way in sports, but right before that, Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic helped us to bring you this segment. Almost soy asini, uh -huh, to bring you the segment. So they're offering you, if you're a man, prostate screening for free. If you're a woman, fertility screening for free. Just head to any of their branches across Pentex office of the Shell Sign Board, Kumase Kronoma way here behind the Angel Educational Complex, the Stakra Energy State. Tema Community 22, Techi Manhanswa, and Estia Manzama. Their call lines 0244 867 068 or 0274 234 321. End point homeopathic clinic, the end to chronic disease. Do stay with us for sports. Up next.